Yeah, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. This is a huge passion of mine to be able to um, empower patients with choices and increase their toolkit for uh, treatments and to stay well. So 27 years as an internist, I just want to give you guys a background of why, why I'm so passionate about this and why I have gotten into lifestyle medicine and functional medicine. About uh, 23 years ago, I started practicing um, and in a practice where I felt like, you know, I was just putting out fires all day. You know, you give, you come in with a, a heartburn and people get a medicine and that medicine gives you three side effects. And then you got to give more medicines for those side effects and it goes on and on and on. And so part of the issue was I just was looking for tools for myself and my patients about how they can heal themselves and the concept of sick medicine versus well medicine, which is we want to kind of get people not just in a disease-free state, where they don't have high blood pressure, don't have diabetes, but also get people to thrive, push them back past zero and get people living their optimal life. And what I found is that, you know, there's a multitude of, of things that we have in our toolkit that we're, um, you know, excited about talking about. I've talked about it in my book. Um, we talk about it in our lectures, but this lecture specifically is about this concept of how we really have control over our health. Uh, based on our choices. And the concept of destiny, you're destined by your genes, never really, really sat well with me. I really wanted to uh, understand why, you know, we have more control. And epigenetics is a huge field of medicine that's been coming out that kind of um, talks about how we can change the way our genes present. We're never going to change the genes we have because that's an imprint, that's the blueprint for our bodies. But we can turn on and off those genes and we can change the way the transcription of those genes happens, what proteins are generated, what kind of inflammation is generated, what our risks are. So that's really what we're focusing on is the science behind how our lifestyle impacts our genes. The immune system is key to this fundamental concept. So our immune system is not good or bad. We are trying to... Um, you know, where we need to quantify how our immune system has a role in everything. With COVID, we've had a lot of talk about the immune system. And those people who did, you know, well with COVID were oftentimes people who had more resilient immune systems, whether they were on plant-based diets or they were of optimal body weight, they didn't have high blood pressure. Because the immune system is our body's itis response. It is a response to a foreigner. It's a response to something it's angry about. Um, it responds to help keep us safe and help us thrive. So it's not all bad or good because we will talk about the fact that there is an acute response that's very necessary. Our immune system is not the bad guy, keeps us alive, but it's the chronic inflammation that we feed it that our um, choices can you know, manifest as that really throws the immune system off. So it responds to toxins or pathogens. There are white cells in our bodies that respond to pathogens that maintain balance in the body. They recruit inflammatory markers. So they recruit friends when there's, an, uh, there's a um, mechanism of trauma or injury or a wound where you're hurt and you need something to get better, whether you have an infection, it recruits cells called cytokines and inflammatory markers that basically help us fight the bad guy. They're members of the white cell family, they're cytokines, they're white cells in, inducing acute inflammation. And when it's persistent, when it's chronic, that is really the mechanism of when we start to get potential for tissue organ damage. And epigenetics can change our modulation of the immune system, which means that the, the manifestation of our choices, our lifestyle choices, can change how our immune system turns on and off. So there is a difference between acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. So the acute inflammation response is very critical to us. We never want to stop inflammation in general. We don't want to take too many antioxidants or too many anti-inflammatories so that we have no response system because when we have damage, say from being out in the sun or like going next to poison ivy or something that's toxic to our skin, we need the body to heal itself. And so that's an inflammatory response. Then the skin and itis of the skin can be a dermatitis. It can be a rash. It can be a sunburn. 
um, when we have a cold, when we have um, a viral infection or bacterial infection settles in our sinuses and it settles in our lungs, it can be a sinusitis or a bronchitis or a pneumonia. And this is where our immune system is used to help recruit our cells, which are anti-inflammatory, but pro-inflammatory too, to try to get the bad guys out, shuffle, shuffle it back to our lymph system and drain it. So the presence of lymph nodes is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be very therapeutic in our healing. So we want an, a response that's robust, that's acting on itself and helping us heal. The problem is that when we persistently keep those signals on, when we have chronic inflammation, we can change that path of cell signaling that decreases the rate of cell regulation, which means that when our cells are ready to kind of pass on, or there's bad cells that are kind of full of, full of cancer because we're fighting cancer all the time, or autoimmune cells, or we have cells that are pre-diabetic or insulin resistant, we have a self-regulation system that can get rid of those cells and, and, and cells die. There's appropriate mechanisms of cell birth and death. But then there's a zombie state called senescence where they're just hanging out. They're not going anywhere. They're just creating a lot of inflammation in the body. And when there's chronic inflammation, it decreases that rate of self-regulation and it decreases the rate of how well we can do self-repair to our tissues, our tissue injury, and eventually it can cause organ dysfunction. So an organ dysfunction, say for the heart, can present as heart disease, heart attacks, congestive heart failure and organ uh, dysfunction in the brain, neuroinflammation can look like things like anxiety, depression, memory loss. So every organ has an itis component to it, which is really a part of why we need to focus on this immune system because an itis of say your gut can look like heartburn, indigestion, bloating, gas, um, inability to lose weight, for example. So all of these signs are an itis of something. Inflammation can have blood markers with it. People always come to me and say, my blood was normal. I don't know why I don't feel well. So inflammation, I'm very much about data in terms of personalizing medicine for people. So I use a lot of laboratory data to help me analyze what's off in each person. And sometimes these markers are helpful, but there are times where you can be totally inflamed and you can have normal labs. So um, the IL-6, the alpha, TNF-alpha, there's natural killer self, NF-kappa B markers, there's CBCs, there's C-reactive protein, there's SED rates that are possibly elevated. But just because these labs are normal does not mean that your symptoms aren't legit, that you don't have an itis of something. So I go by history, 80% of the time, physical, and also the laboratory data can be helpful, but it's not the end-all be-all by any means. There are very well-known triggers of inflammation and gene modification that we should all be aware of. And most of us are aware that smoking is a big trigger, which can turn on genes for multiple types of cancers, for multiple dysfunctions of the organs in the, in the body. Um, being obese, being having an elevated BMI, which is a ratio of your height to weight, can be, if that's over, um, ideally we like people around 27. If you're over um, uh, 27, you're overweight. And if you're over 30 as a height weight ratio, you're considered obese. And that is an uh, inflammatory condition that your body can have a lot of medical issues connected to it. So weight gain that's excessive, especially in the central area where there's visceral fat, which means fat around the organs, is much more detrimental than fat, say, under the arm or in the thigh area. Um, the, the midsection fat is, a, is an important tool to gauge how maybe um, inflamed your body is, even if those markers are normal. Um, alcohol use, excessive alcohol use um, is also a trigger for having dysfunction with different mechanisms in the body. Of course, stress, which we'll talk about in more detail in this lecture, environmental pollution, chemical exposure, which can be through our water, our foods. You know, there's a lot of processing. There's a lot of soil issues. There's a lot of things that are fed to um, animals and, and in the water system itself that have plastics and chemicals in there. So we do have this exposure that's constant that we need to be aware of. And then there's endocrine disruptors, which we'll talk about, like phthalates and BPA, which are in our plastics. 
um, which, which are on our receipts and multiple things that disrupt our hormone system that can be triggers for cascading an inflammatory condition within our system. So these are some things that we will touch on later and speak to in more detail. Um, epigenetics is the study of how our behaviors and our environmental exposures can cause changes that, that affect the way our genes work. Remember, we have 23,000 genes as humans, and I um, and, and those are something that you're born in with. And there's only about, you know, sometimes only 0.1% to 1% variation within humans that make us our unique different beings. So our genes are part and parcel of our blueprint, but that they're not reversible, but the epigenetics are reversible, meaning our lifestyle choices can turn on and off genes. So if your family history has rheumatoid arthritis, family history has certain cancers, many of the times those can be manipulated. Not all, there are some genes that have a very, very high penetration rate, 50% risk convert. There's a lot of genes that, they're not a lot, there's some genes that have a higher rates of transference, but in general, most genes with the epigenetics input can be reversible in terms of your risk. So when we have a genetic predisposition, we have say a virus or we have stress or we have some sort of input, a pollutant, um, some of the things I, I listed on the previous slide, they can turn on those genes that we were born with, but they can also help you maintain and turn off some of the inflammation that are, we are kind of predisposed first. So they're not changing the DNA sequence, but what they're changing is the proteins that are created, which kind of cause enzymatic reactions and inflammation in our body. And epigenetics can change the way we modulate the immune system. That is really the take home message is that we can change our body's immune system by the way we pick our um, lifestyle choices. This is one of the major studies that is available to us that really highlighted the role of lifestyle. So when we look at heart disease, we can use um, something called a calcium score, which looks at the way our bodies are storing calcium. And this is calcium score is a little bit um, controversial in the sense that it just looks at hard plaque, which is the plaque that is fixed. It's a fixed calcium, and sometimes that is not the one that's responsible for blocking that artery. It's the soft plaque, but it is an indirect gauge of how much plaque former a person is. And we're using it a lot more for family history of heart disease. When patients come to me to say, you know, do I, should I go on a statin? What should I do? We use calcium scores to gauge risk along with some of the other markers like the ASCVD score. Um, but calcium score, they looked at you know, favorable lifestyle or unfavorable lifestyle, which looked at if they were smoking, if they were active, what diet that they ate, um, and also, you know, overall kind of just um, lifestyle factors that can help you with heart disease. So lowering risk with blood pressure and things like that. And when they looked at um, favorable lifestyle versus unfavorable lifestyle, even in the genetically predisposed, even with the people that have the highest genetic risk and family history risk, they saw a 50% reduction in heart disease when people were employing a favorable lifestyle. And this is really empowering because a lot of people feel doomed and destined and, and kind of have this kind of heavy feeling that, oh my gosh, these are my genes that I have, especially in the world of dementia and memory loss. But this should be very empowering for people to know that their lifestyles matter and they can change their history course. So this is just a slide to kind of explain the science behind how these things work. There are things called histones, which are on the chromatin and the DNA, which are modified based on our lifestyle choices. There's RNA, which then transfers into proteins that can um, change when we are changing our lifestyle. And it can contribute to inflammation or anti-inflammation. And just as a plug for why inflammation is so important, why this buzzword is so important, remember almost every medical illness that we have in our medical textbooks has a role of an itis in it. <laughs>